who started advanced roofing with a $15,000 loan for my dad. And I kept on saying that we, we have really good clients and let's keep servicing them with more services. And the HVAC air conditioning came about, electrical, sheet metal, cranes. We own our own equipment. And then solar came around in 2007. Michael, my son, and another gentleman, Jan, came in with a piece of thin film solar called Unisolar. And uh, we private labeled that under FlexLight and we sold that around the world. At the same time, we started doing our own installations as an EPC contractor. And today we have over 250 megawatts of PVC installed. And um, part of our company is that we have all our employees get technically up to speed. We have NAPSEP, LEED certified employees, our, our contracts and our jobs get award winning. We have several awards from the Florida Shoot Sheet Metal Association. And also we developed our own solar education center to teach the public on the importance of solar and how much they actually save. Uh, we do a lot of with installing solar lights, solar tubes, skylights. Uh, we, we have um, all our fleets are biofuel, biodiesel fuel, and we do job site recycling of insulation, membrane, and aluminum. Uh, we, we use um, electric and hybrid vehicles. Kevin and I drive Teslas. All our delivery cars have hybrid in them. We uh, have uh, charging stations. We have hybrid air conditioning cold. And uh, we use LED, LED lighting throughout the building. We have solar panels on three of our buildings. One's a carport and then two on our service building and as well as over on the AGT solar side. And um, I, what I'd like to do is now introduce Clint, who's gonna be doing the whole presentation on solar. Clint grew up in a family business in Cleveland, Ohio, in the roofing business as well. Came down here 17 years ago and joined an advanced roofing family. And today he oversees the sales and operations of not only roofing and solar, but he also qualifies part of the company with his solar license, roofing, and general contracting. So Clint, let's take it away. Hey, thanks for the introduction, Rob. Really uh, appreciate it. Thanks for everybody joining us today as well. Uh, looks like we have a, a really great crowd here. A lot of good topics to talk about. Um, first, you know, I want to just talk about a, a real quick crash course on solar in general, kind of how it works, where we start uh, the process, and and give you guys some just visual reference as to what solar is and how it operates. So uh, solar panels, for those of you who don't know or maybe new to the topic, produce DC power, similar to what a battery produces, uh, or even a generator would produce DC power that has to be converted to AC power. So uh, we put these solar panels together to create a solar array, whether it's on a roof or on the ground, on a carport. Um, and those, those panels create this DC electric. Uh, you see in the graphic that DC electric is wired through what we call an inverter. The inverter is kind of like the brains of an operation. If the solar panel is the heart, it's pumping the blood, making the energy. Uh, the inverters are very much like the brain of the operation. Uh, these inverters can tell what type of power your, your house is using, whether it's 480, 277 commercial service or it's a 240 volt residential service. They create that AC electric to match what your needs are. So they convert DC to AC electric through an inverter. That inverter feed is hooked directly into your house panel or to your commercial business panel. Uh, and then you're able to consume that, that electric directly. Uh, you kind of have this bi-directional function then uh, through some of the state laws that we'll touch on later called net metering where if you're ever producing more than you can consume at the time, you're able to send that electricity back out to the electric grid. And then the bi-directional part is we're also able to pull that off as well. So that's a grid tied type solution where we're using utility power in conjunction with your own generated solar electric um, as a bi-directional system. We're able to take energy in and out. Now you're always using your own power first in this setup, meaning if you have power available from your solar circuit, you're gonna consume that before you go to the grid and your grid's only a subsidy to help support the solar production. Now in an off-grid system where we actually don't have access to the utility grid, we can create that utility grid using batteries. So we're able to take that DC power, charge those batteries directly, uh, store that power for use later, 
and now we kind of create our own grid out of batteries and that's called your off-grid system. Uh, today's market, you're also seeing hybrid systems as well, where we literally just combine these two functionalities and we have this grid tied uh, net metered system that's going on with the utility. In the event of an outage, we're able to switch over to that battery power and have the best of both worlds. Uh, and that's called a hybrid system. So that's kind of a crash course on, on solar and how it works. Uh, we're going to get into what we're seeing specifically in that commercial and industrial market. Like Rob said, you know, we built the company in the commercial world and the overwhelmingly most cost effective way and in one of the largest ways solar is being used right now in the commercial industrial market is in the rooftop segment. Uh, showing you some graphic images here to kind of give you an idea that, you know, we're able to install these systems on basically any roof system that's out there. Uh, top left is our Toys R Us project. At the time it was built, it was the largest solar project in North America. It's 5.3 megawatts. It's over 12 acres of distribution center. Now, Toys R Us is out of business, uh, but nearly 10 years later, that, that system is still producing an enormous amount of power for the current building occupant. Um, and that was done over a large warehouse with a uh, existing standing seam roof. Lower left, we see a typical flat roof membrane system. This is a PVC single ply. Uh, this was just built in Deerfield Beach uh, on the new JM family, Southeast Toyota headquarters office. Uh, we were able to seamlessly integrate that system into a, a membrane type roof. Uh, you know, this is a low sloped uh, application. It was designed to FM global wind speeds, factory mutuals, uh, insurance requirements. So over 180 mile an hour engineering requirements went into that system. But that's an example of an integration into low slope roofing. Uh, Beacon Hill in the center down below is a, is a steep sloped uh, multifamily tenant uh, building. We're looking at an integration into a standing seam metal using a, a railed system, another engineered system. But the message is rooftop is very diverse. We can uh, adapt and integrate into really any type of uh, commercial flat roof, sloped roof uh, system that's out there. It's really all in the details about how we engineer it and put it together. Uh, if we go into the next slide, we're going to have a quick poll real quick to talk about. And the question is, does your rooftop uh, solar void your roofing warranty? Um, and, yeah, I like this. We're getting live, live action results. And um, we'll give it a few seconds for the, uh, for the answers to come in. And it looks like the early horse is, depends on how it's installed. So we'll go ahead and share those results. About 60% of you uh, said it depends on how it's installed. We got a couple of yeses, a couple of noes. Uh, and you guys nailed it. The answer is it really does depend on how it's installed. You know, it's one of the biggest questions that we face every time we come in to talk to somebody about a potential installation, uh, which is, you know, hey, what is this going to do to my roof? How do you guys handle it? Uh, and it's a very good question because we see some of the worst horror stories in the industry, then we are often coming in to fix these stories. Uh, the bottom left was an installation on a, on a lawyer's office, uh, believe it or not, in the Palm Beach area. And, you know, that roof is less than 10 years old. We just replaced it two months ago and just reinstalled a solar system. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, you know, a contractor with zero roofing experience was hired, drove uh, threaded rods right through a roofing system, decided to caulk it off. Uh, and it led to a catastrophic failure of the membrane, uh, really just through nothing but poor design. Obviously, the manufacturer at that point walked away and washed his hands of that, that warranty completely. So the answer in that circumstance was yes. Um, we're starting to see some sort of, uh, you know, thought that just adhering roofing uh, structural member or, or adhering solar structural members to a roof uh, membrane is, a, uh, is an, an appropriate way to, to mount uh, racking systems as well, like we're seeing in the picture in the center. Uh, what they don't realize is while it might hold one or two times, when you subject load to the roof membrane like that, the roof is not meant to withstand those types of loads. So uh, that is also a warranty failure. But we do have ways to design these systems to meet uh, warranty requirements. Uh, the three flashings on the right are manufacturer approved, vetted flashing methods, uh, the Olympic power grip in the middle, uh, the, the U-anchor in the top for your modified bitumen roofs. 
And then an S5 clamp, which is an engineered uh, pressure clamp a system for rails over metal roofing. Uh, if we roll into the next slide, you know, the process of qualifying your roof warranty really just starts early in the design phase. Uh, you want to engage the roofing manufacturer and talk to them about what you're doing. They all have set methods of how to get these systems approved for integration. Uh, very very uh, terms and conditions are outlined for what they do cover and what they won't cover. And when you go through that step-by-step -step process to engage them early, to show them your details, to make sure you're following those details, you get what's called a letter of compliance, a letter of continuation. Uh, you know, and that really makes sure that, you know, your, your warranty is taken care of, your roof is taken care of, best practices are being followed because we've seen it a million times over. People love solar. Solar has great benefits, whether it's financial return, uh, environmental stewardship. But if your roof is leaking and the primary function of that building is taken out, uh, nobody really cares about the solar and how it's going to be performing at that time. So, you know, we're able to absolutely continue warranty, not affect them, integrate successfully. It's really about checking, checking the boxes and doing things right and following best practices. I'm going to show a quick video uh, about exactly how this works out in real life. Uh, this is a case study done uh, for a project last year for Dairy Mix. And uh, you know, watch this kind of come together in uh, this video. Dairy Mix is a 70-year-old manufacturer based in St. Petersburg, Florida that manufactures ice cream mix for a lot of different clients, mainly McDonald's. Dairy Mix hired Advanced Roofing to install a 60 mil GAF-TPO roofing system and a 200 kilowatt solar array on their manufacturing facility located in St. Petersburg, Florida. They have a 30,000 square foot uh, manufacturing facility. It's comprised of several different roofing areas, roofing levels. Three of which have solar panels installed on them. It is an operational facility, a food manufacturing facility, so we had to make sure that the facility stayed operational, that all of the coolers were operational the entire time. Shutdown for the solar array was critical. And so what we did was we had the roofing team come in first, install all of the new membranes before prior to the solar team's arrival. And we specified OMG pipe grip uh, attachment points, which are essentially roofing material integrated into a structural attachment. The project is unique and from a standpoint as, you know, we're integrating into an operational food production facility where there's high quality standards that are put in place. So when we're able to come in and replace a roof on operational structure, integrate a solar array, take the entire facility offline and then bring it back on flawlessly, uh, that's where we really pride ourselves. So that just gives everybody a look at, at how it works. And, you know, one thing that is touched on there, and we'll touch on a little bit earlier, you know, that was going into a new roof. Uh, you know, we, we take a lot of time and effort to qualify the roof system itself to make sure it's at a point in time where, you know, that 25 year expected lifetime of, of, uh, of a rooftop solar array is in alignment with the, the roofing system as well. It doesn't mean it has to be new but it does mean that the owner should have some confidence that it can be maintained to last the entire time. Uh, you know, the next segment that we wanna talk about in that commercial and industrial market is carports and garage tops. Uh, this is really in Florida, our fastest growing market for our company right now. Uh, we're, we're building three large projects for some of the world's biggest Fortune 500 companies. Uh, here in Florida. And, you know, garage and carport solar really kind of take that underutilized space out and, and, and turn them into something uh, that, that's functional from a lot of different perspectives. Uh, building occupants and, and, and uh, uh, employees really ben benefit greatly from having covered parking. You're now able to produce energy on a much broader scale. Uh, some folks, you know, in a high rise, mid -rise, off mid, mid rise office buildings, they have a, a small footprint comparative to how many people are in the building, how much electricity they're using. So when you start talking about now adding carports in, you really open up a whole new level of conversation. Um, the Lockheed Martin project down in the bottom, we're gonna see a little bit more about how that was built. Uh, 
that was uh, that was and still is the largest carport in Florida. We're currently building one larger right in Highland Manors uh, next door in Tampa, which is the top right. It's being, being built on top of a parking garage. But uh, that covers over 600 parking spaces. We were able to take uh, our engineering background, our structural steel background, our general contracting licenses, and uh, redo their entire parking lot, cast the foundations in place, and then integrate this, uh, this carport that ultimately took over 65% of Lockheed's manufacturing uh, energy needs offline and is now produced right on site. Um, you know, integrating into the parking garages seems to be one of the newest things that's out there. We, we put a lot of time and effort into qualifying the structure. If it's not meant, if it wasn't originally designed, can it be integrated? Uh, we find that 90% of the time it can be with very minimal upgrades. But once again, you know, we're taking this underutilized spot uh, and we're turning it around and putting a solar asset in place. Uh, you know, we can integrate lighting, security features, uh, really anything you need to put together that would have a, you know, be in that parking lot, you just now have it covered. Uh, we also have water management that can be done as well. So they can be completely watertight or just shade structures. So we're going to move into that video to kind of show the production and what it looks like when we take a, a parking lot from a uh, standard parking lot into a, into a solar covered canopy. It's interesting when we talk about carports in general is you know they're all site specific engineered there is no out of the box solution so uh, we showed you that video is our super span structure uh, it's made to cover a drive lane and then four parking spots but we can really build them to any type of uh, facility that's out there so when we look at it there is no one approach that's out of a box uh, we build them all to uh, the site specific uh, kind of needs for the facility or the ownership group one of the newer trends in solar, and actually, actually, I think it's one of the most exciting trends in solar, is kind of this architectural movement, kind of taking solar out of that. Um, it's here just for the functionality of producing electricity and, and a return, and then blending it in with this architecture, bringing art in, and really bringing solar to the visible eye. Uh, you know, rooftop solar is great, has a, a, an enormous ROI, internal rate of return. The economics are, are very solid. Uh, carports serve as this, uh, you know, way to uh, cover parking, give shade, make money. Uh, but then you look at these architectural pieces 
And you're really talking about beautification of structures. You're talking about functionality along with design. Uh, top left is an example of a pergola using a, a Lumos panel. That's a, a solar, solar panel manufacturer that we, uh, that we build with often. Uh, these guys make a beautiful product, but it can be integrated into uh, canopies, covered uh, eating areas, lounge areas, pergolas, uh, solar trees by Spotlight Solar in the middle. Uh, we installed the first solar tree in the Southeast United States for Everglades University back in 2010. And uh, since then, FPNL has built over 200 of them as part of their public outreach program, uh, of which Advanced built a significant portion of them. But you're bringing solar down to this ground level, uh, having this really visual impact. Uh, as of lately, we've been seeing them built into vertical uh, facades, like on the bottom left, where you're seeing uh, vertical walls instead of having uh, glass uh, glazing uh, for your outside screens. You, you're, you're putting on solar panels and and taking advantage of that visual impact along with the, uh, the economic impact as well. So this is a way that people are using solar in the marketplace today to really bring that to the constituents, bring it to, to the ground level and show beautification. Now, the return associated with these isn't often the same, but the goal isn't the same either. And that's a big question that we always ask everybody when we're talking about engaging into solar, which is, you know, what are your goals? Because uh, you know, someone who has a, uh, an investment metric of four years ROI is maybe looking at a completely different project than someone who's looking to draw attention to their building, bring people in uh, to, you know, to, to a business or uh, help bring visibility and show that they're, that they're moving the needle with their environmental initiatives. And so we try to blend those goals, have those conversations early with folks to show uh, exactly what's going on. Architectural solar really brings that down to that ground level uh, and mixes functionality with beauty and art and architecture. So uh, last but definitely not least in the in that commercial and industrial world is ground mounted solar. You know, a, a lot of people, if you're familiar with the industry, you think of ground mounts, you think of 100 acre, 200 acre, 1000 acre fields, solar fields. Uh, they're installed by utilities to transmit into the transmission line. Um, and an interesting thing too, Trump just, uh, President Trump just endorsed the largest solar array in the United States is going to be built in uh, the desert, 640 megawatts. Uh, that's going to be uh, top 10 in the world as far as its size. It's like two hours north of uh, Nevada. So awesome to see the administration push in some solar initiatives. Uh, and, and, uh, but we can also take that ground mounted technology and use it in the commercial and industrial space. Um, and what you're seeing top left is a reverse osmosis water treatment plant in the city of Tarpon Springs that we recently completed. It's a 200 kilowatt uh, solar array. It's helping offset the energy needs that Tarpon Springs has to create their fresh drinking water. Uh, you know, we're able to use that kind of uh, peripheral space, right? They have water tanks and they have small buildings, but they didn't have anything with enough space uh, to, to house it for rooftop. So, you know, we looked and we said, well, what can we do on the peripheral of the property? Uh, we're right up against a fence line. You can see in the bottom picture, that's the opposite uh, facing uh, angle of the system. We were able to squeeze in this amount of power into this kind of unused land that's associated with some commercial properties. Uh, John Lloyd Park on the right was the first ground mount that we had built in Florida. It had a custom uh, foundation, uh, which kept us above the water line. There was concerns because John Lloyd Park, anybody who knows and is familiar with um, South Florida, this sits in between the intracoastal and the ocean, and uh, it's barely above the water line. So uh, we, can, we can deploy these uh, ground mounted solutions. They're often cost effective. Uh, and, they, and they're definitely in space constrained areas. You don't have enough roofing or enough, enough roof area to fit something. Uh, ground mounts a uh, great way to look at it. We're gonna show you a quick video on a uh, ground mounted project that we built for the city of Lake Worth. And this is kind of a hybrid between commercial and industrial and utility scale. It's actually a uh, two megawatt solar array that was built on a landfill. So if we roll into the next slide, um, one of the, the coolest things about this is I can't even hardly say that with a straight face, but, um, and now 
It, it really is. We, we, we love the cellar. It's, it's, uh, it's an unbelievable journey we've been on the last 13 years building these projects, but the Lake Worth project was really cool. This is an old capped landfill. So you want to talk about changing uh, a giant mound of trash into something that is uh, really impactful. Uh, you know, we took this, this project in, con in coordination with Siemens and we engineered uh, and procured and constructed the whole project. You can see right now we're setting a, a, a road base and a weed barrier to stop any weeds from coming up. Uh, I forget the amount of yards of concrete that we poured, but because it is a landfill, it actually has a clay cap to keep water from uh, infiltrating through the trash. Uh, so we had to co uh, coordinate with uh, the FDEP uh, to ensure that we never breached that clay cap. So we had water quality management, uh, a lot of eyes on this, this project, uh, but we're using underutilized or maybe even unutilizable space, right? We're not building anything on top of a landfill in the next thousand years, uh, but we were able to build uh, this solar array. So when you're looking at your options, thinking about, you know, hey, I don't want it on my roof. I don't have a good roof. Uh, we don't have any parking garages, but, you know, I have this, uh, this brown field. I have this little shoulder of land here. Uh, ground mounted solar can be done. We can drive posts in the ground very economically. If we have ground issues, we can we can pour these concrete ballast solutions like what you're seeing in the video. Uh, but ground mounted solar is flexible. It's deployable at really any scale down from 50 kilowatts to up to this this project here, which was two megawatts, uh, you know, taking several hundred homes in Lake Worth off of the utility grid completely. Um, so really uh, unique and interesting project. Uh, time for another quick poll. I want to hear what you folks have to say. How much solar do you think can you fit on a typical 10,000 square foot uh, roof? And Clint, while we uh, give the attendees a chance to answer, we got two questions related to battery storage. So the first one was, can carports attach to any kind of batteries? Uh, let them know, you know, batteries can be attached to, to any solar system, but it adds cost. Do you have any examples of, of clients that have used batteries on a, a corp, carport or ground mount system? Yeah, so the, the fundamentals between using batteries on carports or inside rooftop uh, uh, ground mounted utilities uh, scale systems is really the same. Uh, so the answer is yes, we can put batteries in them. Uh, you know, the question would be, and it always is really, regardless of, of where you're, you're setting um, your, your batteries, is what do you want to offset and, and how are we going to manage that, right? Uh, you know, we, we, when we're sizing batteries, we need to look at uh, the load that's anticipated that's going to be used, meaning, you know, what are all the equipment that you need to run? How long are you going to want to run them every day? And then something that we call redundancy, how many days do you want to be able to run it? One day, two days, three days. Uh, so a lot of questions get asked. Short answer is yes, we can put batteries in. Um, we built the Mayo Clinic project with United Therapeutics. They do net zero on all of their projects. Uh, they have batteries there. Uh, we just did a rooftop array for a, um, a local title and legal company up in the Palm Beach County area. And, uh, you know, they have a, a battery system that backs up some of their critical operations because they couldn't put a generator on the site. So they put a hundred kilowatts of solar on a roof and a large battery system down below to where they can run their lights and fans and computer outlets for up to three days. So uh, we have a lot of flexibility. There's certainly cost added. Um, you know, we're running a, a second poll already. Um, I don't know how that happened, but uh, I did see the answer to the first poll come through uh, where we talked about how much solar can fit in a 10,000 square foot uh, roof. If we can get back to that slide, uh, the winning answer was roughly 100 kilowatts, and and that's a um, and that's that that's actually the correct answer. So I think we're a little off on our sliding. Can we get back on to the slides? All right. So anyways, um, that pulls in as well, 26% on tax credits. And, and that's correct. So we, um, 
we, we like to ask a lot of questions and, and give you guys some info. So we've kind of had this recap on how commercial CNI solar is being uh, put out into the marketplace right now. Rooftops, carports, architectural type solar, and then ground mount solar. Um, some things that we like to give people. Uh, you know, we like to tell everybody you do need to be able to consume the energy on your own site, meaning uh, we can't send energy out to the grid and sell it to third parties or own it. Uh, on, on a place where you're not using it. In Florida, we are not able to have uh, what we call power purchase agreements, PPAs. And so you need to be able to consume the power on the site. Uh, if you do overproduce at the end of a year, we talked about net metering. You can send energy out to the grid and pull it back. And that's fine. That's a one for one exchange. But if you end up at the end of the year having too much overproduction, uh, you get paid out by the utility and it's at a much lower rate than what you buy it for. So it's really not equitable. Um, one of the biggest parts of the, uh, you know, the financial return associated with solar is that tax credit. And so uh, it's very hard for our, uh, some of our nonprofit governmental entities to take advantage of those tax, uh, tax incentives. So we always tell people, uh, you know, you want to be able to take advantage of it. If you're a for-profit company, that's fine. If you're a nonprofit, we do have uh, a state contract with the Department of uh, Management Services that's able to be piggybacked. It's an energy services agreement that allows an ownership and investor group to take the tax credits and those entities to be able to use them. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, mid to long-term vision, you know, solar is a 25 year investment. If uh, you know, you're, you're, you're thinking about selling this building or, you know, you might tear it down in five years. So obviously it's, it's not a great investment. Uh, most of our arrays do break even somewhere in that four to six year time frame, And then we have that 25 year lifespan that we're looking at for cash flow. Uh, and return on investment. So having that mid to long-term vision is good. Um, if you're looking at uh, an energy services agreement or a lease type solution, which uh, we do have available in, in Florida, having some sort of financial stability is good. Uh, it's very important that we know and, and our investors uh, and finance organizations understand that you know they can get their money returned. Now the one uh, caveat to that would be PACE, uh, Property Assessed Clean Energy, which is uh, secured through uh, our property taxes. We're going to talk about that in a little bit as well. And then uh, last but not least, which I talked about before is, you know, if you're going down that rooftop road, making sure we understand that, uh, you know, your roof has some sort of alignment with the lifespan of the solar array or at a minimum understanding what it would cost to have to take that solar off and put it back on at some point throughout the, uh, the solar array's life. Uh, a big part of that solar tax credit ramp down, I saw the poll run earlier, 26% um, is the right answer right now on your tax credit. So for every uh, dollar you spend, you're getting 26 cents back in tax credits. Uh, that is ramping down. So as we, as we start losing our tax credit and utility costs start coming up, uh, the cost of doing nothing goes up as our tax credits go down. Uh, this slide is a little misleading. It's 0% for residential in 2022. It's 10% for commercial is the, uh, the slated step down. So we move on to the next slide. Uh, I hit on this a little bit in the last, uh, last slide, but our finance options, uh, the majority of what we do in Florida right now is cash purchase because that, uh, that PPA is not available. We can't sell power. And if we're not a regulated utility, uh, so a lot of people do cash purchases, but as we will see in a little bit, operating leases are out there. Uh, where you're leasing the solar equipment that's installed on your building, you're making a annual quarterly monthly payment uh, for that, and they keep the tax benefits. Uh, power purchase agreements is where we're selling the energy that's produced. Once again, we can't do that in, uh, in the Florida marketplace, um, but we can uh, do that everywhere else in the country almost. Florida is one of the last, uh, last states that doesn't allow PPAs. I talk about it because it's a common term in the solar industry and I want everybody to understand uh, what it is. The sale of power is illegal in Florida unless you're a regulated utility, uh, but it is a very common way that solar is procured throughout the U.S. Uh, an energy services agreement, we talked about our state of Florida DMS contract that allows us to come in. Uh, we're currently using that contract. Uh, we have three arrays with the DMS, State uh, Department of Management Services. We're building eight arrays right now with Broward County where they use that contract and they're paying nothing out of pocket and they only pay on a fixed monthly uh, quarterly rate actually with that contract. 
uh, for the next 20 years for their energy. Uh, and we were able to meet their goals of staying at their current utility price. So uh, that's a win, very exciting project with Broward County. Uh, and last but not least, we have PACE where uh, we're using the equity in the property itself through property tax assessment, and then you're paid back through uh, your property tax bill every year. That's a nice uh, option. Uh, you, you, the money's kind of expensive, and, but the good news is there is no personal or business credit associated with it. So it's pretty much off balance sheet for the businesses because it uses the property equity to secure the loan. Uh, we like to leave everybody with some good rules of thumb. Uh, we want to talk about typical payback scenarios here on our standard kind of flat roof scenarios. We're looking at four to six years. There's some ways that we can combine uh, roofing operations and lower costs. And we'll talk about that in a little bit with one of our case studies. Uh, but four to six years is, uh, is a pretty standard payback time in Florida for a cash purchase solar array on a rooftop. Uh, our carports, because of that additional infrastructure, we certainly have a, a, a longer payback period. And it ranges quite a bit with scale, anywhere from six to 12 years, depending on how large the system uh, is. Now, you know, the ROIs are all based on the ability to use the depreciation, to use the tax credits. We talked about those federal incentives uh, and then, you know, taking that energy savings over that 25 year lifespan. So, um, you know, and, and solar is 25 year warranted. A lot of uh, the new tier one panels also uh, even are going out to 30. So we're starting to see those, um, we're starting to see those uh, warranties even extend further. So something to consider when you're designing and installing there as well. Uh, when we talk about solar incentives, um, right now we're at 26% uh, tax credit, gradual ramp down to over to, to 10% in 2022. Uh, the asset is 100% depreciable in the first year. So uh, that's almost worth the exact same amount as the, the tax credit itself. So when we do depreciate that asset entirely in year one, and we'll see how this plays out in some financial examples, shortly, uh, you know, we're looking at getting nearly 50% of our investment back in that very first year and then gaining the rest of that back over time with the energy savings every year that we get. Uh, some things that help facilitate Florida uh, uh, solar installations in the state of Florida, net metering, that's what allows us to plug into the utilities grid and gain their power while using our power and kind of going back and forth. Uh, not every state has a net metering law, so that is a great benefit for Florida. All solar equipment is sales tax exempt in Florida. Some people don't realize that. We do a lot of municipal work and they wanna know how much tax savings that they're getting uh, by being a nonprofit or a tax exempt entity. Uh, the answer is none because all solar uh, equipment and goods are tax exempt in the state. You also have a property tax exemption. So any increases in your real property value uh, associated with, the, with a new installation will not raise your property taxes. Uh, another great benefit as well. I'm going to toss it over and let Mike talk a little bit. Mike Cornerns, uh, he's a, another owner here at Advanced and uh, has been uh, with AGT since inception, like Rob had mentioned. Uh, Beacon Hill is a great project where we used a lot of our different brands to come in and really change the complexity, the complexion of a, of a project. So we're going to show you a video here quickly on this. <laughs> Groups of companies, both Advanced Roofing and Advanced Green, were hired on this project. Advanced Roofing came in and tore off the existing shingle roofs and put on a new standing seam architectural metal roofing system. Uh, that that roof's designed to last over 30 years. It's hurricane uh, hurricane rated, designed to exceed local wind speeds. While that was also happening, Advanced Green Technologies was hired to come in and do the engineering, procurement, and construction of the 25 solar arrays on each of the buildings. Um, you know that interconnection design was was very uh, let's just call it intricate, detailed. Working with the utilities to ultimately take out of service just about 194 total apartments inside 24 buildings plus the clubhouse that we ultimately integrated solar into all of them. Thanks, Cliff. Good afternoon, everybody. So that was a very cool project. Um, there's one neat thing um, about doing 
solar when you're doing your re-roofing process. Um, when you go to do your re-roofing um, and you put solar down, you can take part of that ITC, the federal tax credit, which is 26% off your roofing bill. Um, and an analogy that I like to use is that you wouldn't build a new power plant on an old foundation. So you wouldn't go and construct and buy a new power plant and put it on old concrete. So the federal government, um, through <clears throat> um, ITC rulings, federal rulings have allowed you to take um, not all of, but above 50%, and I'd advise you to talk to your tax consultant, of your re-roofing cost in your ITC um, credit with your uh, solar system. So that's something to take into consideration and that, that actually finance put that Beacon Hill project over the top. Um, that Beacon Hill project was able to, uh, you know, put the new metal roof down the foundation and put the solar on it. There has been a couple other questions here that I'll address. Uh, one of the questions was um, hurricane season's coming, there's a high rise building, what wind speeds uh, the solar panel sustained. Um, the highest one that I believe we've been involved in is 164 or 165 um, engineered uh, system. The glass panels are double-sided glass. Um, they're very structural um, sound. Uh, so what we do is we enhance the rails um, and the attachment methods of the system. Um, there's different ways you can attach them to the roof through a fully uh, mechanically attached a ballast hybrid system or a full on structural steel system. So we have all different kinds of systems that will meet those um, wind loads. And that kind of dovetails into the second question. You know, it's a high rise building, but Mike, it's on the beach and there's salt water. Well, yes, there's um, all the solar panels. Um, the frames are all aluminum um, and all the connections are copper. So there's the resistance to salt. All of the hardware that we use to mount the systems are all, all aluminum and stainless steel fasteners um, on the light gauge framing. Um, and then if we have to go to heavy gauge framing, for example, the carports, uh, the carports are all um, galvanized, uh, hot dipped, galvanized on the uprights and the purlins. And then if we, on the large, large structural members, um, if we cannot get them galvanized, hot dipped, we will paint them with a two coat epoxy coating system. So these are all means and methods of construction that are tried and true um, in our South Florida environment. Um, so I hope that answers those two questions. Excellent, Mike. Do you have any examples of the large ones that went through the last hurricane season? Um, yeah, that's a great question. So. Yeah, after we, we've, we've been sprinkled, um, I've been doing this since 07, and we've had hurricanes throughout. Um, we got a chance to survey a site in Daytona Beach Speedway, which we did for a large utility, I'm saying this without names, um, and AGT did two of the four systems there, um, and there were some panels lost in the other systems and none in ours. But the panels that were lost, even on the other ones, were due to flying debris. Um, you can't, you know, you can have the most perfect hurricane-proof windows, but then if a two-by-four flies through it, it's still going to crack. So we, we've sustained a good amount of hurricanes and have had very little um, to any damage done to the panels. And, and any damage that I have seen has been from flying debris, which is uncontrollable in, a, in, that, in that situation. And to expand on that as well, there's been a lot of uh, lessons learned from Matthew going through Puerto Rico and the United States for, and in the USVI, Virgin Islands as well. Uh, you know, some of those lessons learned are things that we've had in practice for a long time, uh, specifically using a top-down clamping method uh, where, where we're actually bolting down through a clamp. Uh, they found that those are very susceptible to vibration. And so rather than using top-down clamps where we're kind of pressure sa sandwiching the, the module frame with a clamping system, we're using bolts now that are bolted connections from underneath the frames on all of our carports. Uh, we've never lost a panel to Michael's point, uh, but one of the determining factors in some of the failures in Matthew, which was well over 180 miles an hour, um, was uh, the fact that they were using uh, these top-down clamps that were very susceptible to vibration. Uh, and to also expand on Mike's, 165 is a, is a common uh, wind speed. We've been to 180 on almost all of our factory mutual insured projects, Lockheed Martin, JM Family, 
Uh, so there's really no wind speed in Florida that we can't engineer to, but Mike nailed it on the head. It's all about analyzing our connections. A lot of people fail to take the connection further down as well. You know, it's great to say that our connection from our solar panels to our posts and our racking system will work and it will. FM Global takes it one step further and says, hey, now that you've connected this to the roof structure, will the roof structure work? And we've always been able to work through that as well. Uh, so a uh, little something else to, to kind of throw in there. Um, you know, moving into system sizing, some questions that we always ask when we're, when we're uh, wanting to talk about solar, when we get started, things that we want to look for. Uh, if you're ever interested in it, things to gather up. 12 months worth of power bills always gives us a good idea of what your usage is. Uh, we would need to know what your corporate tax structure is and your uh, effective tax rates so we can value the depreciation. Um, you know, one thing to give you kind of that rule of thumb, we did a survey earlier, how much, uh, how many KW can a 10,000 square foot roof hold? A general sizing rule of thumb is we just multiply square footage times 10 and that would give us watts. Um, so 100,000 watts or 100 kilowatts on 10,000 feet. Um, and a general rule of thumb for your parking spaces as well is about 3 kW, 33.3 kW, or 3,300 watts per parking spot. Just to give you some rough ideas if you wanted to know how much solar maybe you could fit into a parking spot. Uh, so, you know, what would it look like if you called us up for a feasibility study? And we do these every day, by the way. Feel free to call us. Not a big time investment, no, no, uh, no commitments whatsoever. But if you're interested for a high level financial analysis, uh, we call it a feasibility study. Uh, we really only need a, a handful of things. Those utility bills, uh, the location of where you're thinking, you know, an address in a building or a parking lot area, whatever it might be. Uh, and within a matter of a day, sometimes on the phone, we can run very high level uh, estimates and layouts for, for like what you're seeing right here. This is a large manufacturer in the Tampa St. Pete area, but we can show you roughly a rough order of magnitude of, you know, this many solar panels can fit on your facility. Uh, here's what it would produce and even throw some high level budgetary estimates out there to give you an idea of what it looks like. That feasibility study doesn't have to take a lot of time. Uh, just to see if it's something that's of interest. You know, if we want to combine it with roofing, what would it look like? We can show you that as well. Uh, moving into kind of what the financial analysis looks like, uh, here's some ideas of what cash flows are for, uh, you know, varying types of uh, purchases. You know, uh, these are all the exact same system sizes. Uh, this is a $700,000 solar array that was modeled and ultimately purchased by one of our customers. But we can kind of outlay what each uh, type of purchase looks like, whether it's a cash purchase or an operating lease or a PACE financing. Uh, you can see in a cash purchase here, we come out of pocket that whole $700,000 in that first year. We're gonna have some expenses to operate and maintain it over time. And then we save $50,000 a year, roughly in electricity every year. And what does that look like, right? In our cash purchase, uh, we're breaking even right there in year five and we have a total net uh, income cash flow of about $1.2 million positive cash flow. So it's a very sound investment. Uh, you know, we're talking about that five year ROI. We're talking about getting 15% internal rate of return. That, uh, that beats the, 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 the stock market on average at any, any point in time. Um, you know, that seven year operating lease, you know, the great thing about an operating lease is there's no large cash outlay. You don't have to come up with cash at all you're paying on a fixed payment schedule. Uh, so in that operating lease, uh, you know, you don't come out of money at all in that first year. And then you have $71,000 payments over seven years with a cash buyout in the eighth year. Um, so it's very minimal cash outlay as a you know, opposition with a cash purchase, you're coming out of pocket 700,000 in that operating lease. You never come out of pocket more than 150,000. Uh, but the reduction is in total, uh, rather than saving 1.25 million, you're saving about 951,000. And that's just simply the cost to finance. Uh, but once again, much less cost out of your pocket. Um, a capital lease, which looks a lot like a loan, has a larger payment uh, associated with it, but you get to keep the tax credits yourself. And that operating lease, I forgot to tell you, the, the people who are owning and operating and leasing the equipment, they take the tax credits. In a capital lease, you take the tax credits. Uh, that leads a, a, uh, a million one net benefit to you. 
and then uh, something like pace financing, which has a little longer term associated with it, a little higher interest rate. Um, you're only looking at a total positive cash benefit of 500,000, but you're never out of pocket a dollar. So it really depends on your goals, your cash situation, but we have these financing methods that really make solar uh, available to anybody uh, that's out there. We do have a lot of questions come in recently, so um, we can okay, address. I'll just, um, do you have a ballpark number of cost per kilowatt on carports? Yeah, it, costs, it, it, it varies greatly, like we had talked about in the scale conversation. I can tell you that our largest uh, carports are selling somewhere in the ballpark of 250 to $3 a watt, which would put you at $2,500 to $3,000 a kilowatt. Um, now, you know, smaller scale carports can run upwards of 5,000 to 6,000 a, a kW or five to $6 a watt, pretty large scale from size to size. The other thing that can vary dramatically and Michael kind of touched on it earlier, what are your finishes? You know, we can make carports very architectural. We can make them very industrial. There's costs associated with that. But I think that range of three to $6 a watt kind of encompasses the large scale to the, uh, you know, larger, um, lar uh, to, the, to the larger scale to smaller scale range. Awesome, thanks, Con. We got some questions about maintenance. Uh, one, what maintenance considerations need to be looked at in addition to the normal roof maintenance? And also how about a warranty from discoloration? Yeah, great questions, uh, great questions. So we rely heavily on that inverter we talked about right in the very first slide as being the brains of the operation. Uh, the inverter actually communicates to the web a whole data set every 15 minutes showing us what we're producing, uh, how each line is producing. And we are able to gather that data to know if we have a problem or not. We recommend once a year, what we call preventative maintenance, operations and maintenance. That's us coming out to check your fuses, check your filters, uh, check for corrosion, loose, loose uh, connections, make sure we don't have anything that's kind of gotten itself uh, less structurally sound over time. That's a once a year scheduled uh, maintenance. Uh, other than that, we recommend the remote monitoring through our, through our data system that to where you can see if you have a production loss for some reason that's not explained by the current weather. Uh, so once a year is recommended, uh, some of our bigger clients will have us come out, uh, you know, spring and fall before and after hurricane season. Uh, but a minimum once a year, you want to get eyes on it. Otherwise, we like to monitor it remotely. Um, warranties for discoloration uh, really vary greatly uh, based on use and what the finishes are. Uh, we always provide a workmanship warranty with our, with our solar, all of them. Uh, two years is pretty standard. We go up to five. And if you're engaged in that proactive maintenance conversation, uh, we'll extend that warranty out uh, beyond that point. But the finish warranty itself from the paint manufacturer is the only warranty that would back the actual color fastness. Uh, Advanced doesn't get into warranting paint finishes uh, beyond what the manufacturers do. Okay, excellent. Have you come across any cities not approving solar panels for aesthetic reasons? Uh, it's, it's interesting, actually. Uh, there's, there's state Florida statute that says that they can't, even HOAs can't uh, shut you down from having uh, renewable resources. They have to have, um, uh, now you have to comply and they, they can have set standards of what those optics look like, but they have to give you an option to install that. Uh, that could, goes as far, and, and we, we, it's been a while since I've dusted this off because I don't do a lot of residential, but uh, they consider clotheslines to be a source of renewable energy. Uh, they can't even shut you down from doing that in your HOA if you want to go dry your clothes outside. Um, so there's, uh, there's some interesting state statutes on that. We haven't ran across it, but we're not heavily engaged in that residential market as a, you know, a commercially focused contractor. We do have one more question that just came in last minute. How do you address the cleaning of the surface of the roof or the strainers of internal drains under the panels? That's a great question, Bruce. We, uh, we are adamant about not covering drains, if at all possible, and at a, at a minimum, leaving enough access uh, to get in there. So we like to take a, des a design approach to minimize those interfaces. 
uh, even if it just means leaving a panel out, you know, the panels are spaced adequately enough to where you can walk in between them, but rather than covering them, uh, we prefer to leave those panels out. Uh, you know, code actually also requires that like we leave walkways around all of your maintainable equipment. So uh, you have a minimum six foot setback around HVAC units, uh, those sorts of uh, those sorts of uh, access points that are needed. So it's really about a design approach for us. Uh, you know, we're, we're roofers in our beginning. So um, that's, uh, that's always top of our mind as to what, what needs to be done for proper maintenance. All right, Kevin, looks like Sheila McNamara just uh, weighed in, wanted to know about any specifics for government. Um, we touched on it briefly. Uh, you know, the energy services agreement is a great vehicle for government entities to get engaged uh, with, uh, with solar applications. Uh, we have also have several contracts uh, through SourceWell that allow for cooperative purchasing um, of solar uh, as well. So, you know, the one thing about that energy services agreement though, it doesn't require the capital purchase. So you don't have to have the budget necessarily to develop the projects. That's the vehicle that Broward County used uh, with us to build those current eight projects. Uh, you know, otherwise the solar works the exact same way for government entities as it does for anyone else from a technical approach. It's more about finding ways to use those, those federal incentives uh, to help facilitate the payback rather than just having to abandon them. And then oftentimes is uh, the biggest conversation is, you know, how do we manage budget? Uh, you know, when we can look at the solar from just alleviating the capital, the operating expense of your power bills, which is already budgeted, uh, and just exchanging that for the payments, which is the conversations that we have uh, with, with our government entities is, you know, hey, I spend 100,000 on this facility for electric. We try to use that energy services agreement vehicle to then come in and build that solar array to save them that 100,000. So there is no budget exercise. It's simply using something that's already slotted for capital expenditure. And instead of paying a utility, you're now paying uh, an energy services provider. Appreciate everyone attending.